If you have your copy of God's Word, please join me in the book of Psalms. Today we're going to examine one of the most well-known and comforting psalms that there is written in the Bible. Psalm 23. Psalm 23. Now, throughout my time in college, many years ago, I held many different jobs. I worked in construction. I laid hardwood flooring as well as tile flooring. I worked in a couple of different warehouses where I loaded trucks or unloaded trucks. But one job that I seemed to enjoy the most was that of waiting tables. Now, all of us here today are familiar with the job of a server. As you know, the server's job does not end after taking your order and bringing the food to the table. And really, in many ways, that's just the start of the server's job. Server's jobs consist of bringing you ketchup when you need it for your french fries. When you accidentally drop your knife onto the floor, they'll bring you a new set of silverware. Or they will refill your drink when you ask for a refill. The job of a server is to find out what you need after you need it so that they can bring that need to you. As you see in our text today, Psalm 23, we know that it clearly does not talk about servers, but rather it talks about a shepherd. So let's ask the question, what exactly is the job of a shepherd? If we were to create a chart between these two jobs, a server and a shepherd, we would find a lot of similarities between the two, but we would also find things that make them quite different. Now, they're similar in the way of being able to care for somebody or for something, but what makes them different is the approach and how they care. The server goes to the table to find out exactly what does the guest need, and then he provides the need. The shepherd, on the other hand, is much different. The shepherd is providing for the sheep as he is leading them. He's anticipating what their needs are, all the way to the point where the sheep do not even have to voice what the need is. The shepherd already knows, and he has provided it for them. But notice something that I already said with this. I said that the shepherd is providing for the sheep as he is leading them. This is the job of the shepherd. He provides for the sheep as he is leading the sheep. I have a buddy up north that owns and operates a dairy farm. On his dairy farm, he actually has a few sheep running around the property. So I asked him recently, what was the main difference between caring for cows and caring for sheep? He told me that the main difference between the two is that cows have, have to be herded and sheep must be led. Now, what he means by that is that cows have to be told where they are going to go. They have to be driven in a very specific direction. Sheep, on the other hand, they do not need to be driven anywhere. Rather, they can be led wherever you want them to go. And this is how the shepherd provides for his sheep, because in his leading, he has already provided what they need. Therefore, he then brings them to that item that he has prepared for them. So if this is the case, if this is how he provides, if the shepherd is a good shepherd, the sheep sheep will never lack anything because the shepherd has already provided it for them. And that's really the title of our sermon today. I've entitled our sermon, I Shall Never Lack. I Shall Never Lack. And we see this exact concept here in Psalm 23. The sheep are not herded by the shepherd, but rather the sheep are being led by the shepherd. Look at verse number one with me. 
Verse number one says, The Lord is my shepherd. I shall not want. David, who was the author of the 23rd Psalm, tells us that the Lord, Yahweh God, is his shepherd. God is my shepherd is what King David wrote. And how fitting is it that David, the little shepherd boy who was out in the field watching over his flock, would say that the Lord is his shepherd. And because the Lord is leading his people as a good shepherd, his people will never lack. This is why he says, I shall not want or I shall not lack. Philippians chapter 4 verse 19 My God shall supply all of your need according to his riches and glory in Christ Jesus. So the Lord is my shepherd. I have no need of anything. And beloved, it would be no hermeneutical stretch to actually apply this entire psalm to the Lord Jesus Christ because it was actually the Lord Jesus himself who said in John chapter 10 that he is the good shepherd and the sheep hear his voice and the sheep follow him. So verse 1 is the foundation as to what we will build upon today. The Lord is my shepherd. I shall not lack. So if the Lord is my shepherd and he will provide all of my needs, let's ask the question, what exactly will I not lack? That's the question I want to examine today. And it's a question that will shape the remainder of our time together this morning. Verses 2 through 6, as we will find, we will see that the answers are provided in those verses. And we will find that there will be six different ways that the shepherd provides for his sheep as the shepherd is leading his sheep. So to restate our question again, under the care of the good shepherd, what shall I not lack? Well, first... I shall not lack rest. I shall not lack rest. Verse number two. He makes me to lie down in green pastures. He leads me beside the still waters. Now David tells us that the shepherd will be able to provide rest for the sheep in a way that will restore their souls. Other translations that you may have in your laps right now may use the phrase that he refreshes my souls or or he restores my soul. Uh, Either way, what is in view here is rest. The sheep are receiving rest from the shepherd. But the question is how? How are the sheep being refreshed? How are they being restored? How are they receiving this rest? Well, it's because the the, the shepherd is providing for them pastures that are green and waters that are quiet. Green pastures and quiet waters are, of course, representation of what provides rest and restoration, refreshment for the soul. But there's much more here than what just meets the eye. Beloved, when, when we're reading the scriptures, we have to remember something very important. As Bible students, we have to remember this one concept. When we are reading the scriptures, we are always bringing our minds back to when it was written. We must understand the historical context and what did the author mean when he wrote it. And this is where I believe our time in Psalm 23 is going to become captivating. Why? Because it's at this point, we need to understand more about sheep. She cannot lie down unless certain criteria are met for the sheep. Philip Keller, who was an actual shepherd, he wrote a book that was called A Shepherd Looks at Psalm 23, and it provides uh, insight for us non-shepherds so that we can understand why sheep cannot sometimes rest. Now, in this book, he lists four elements that must be removed in order for the rest, uh, for the sheep to have rest. Four elements that must be removed. First is fear. Fear must be removed. Sheep must not be afraid. Sheep are defenseless animals. So a single predator, like that of a 
wolf could easily kill any sheep with no problem. Therefore, they need protection. They need to be made free of all fear. Therefore, they need a shepherd to protect them so that they can have rest. Secondly is friction. Sheep are social animals, and they're quite social within their flock. The bigger and more aggressive sheep can push the smaller and the weaker sheep away from some of the more nutritional grass that's found in the pastures. The sheep, the shepherd stops all of the silly fighting that can cause friction between the sheep so that the sheep can have rest. Third is flies. Flies must be removed in order for sheep to have rest. In efforts of helping the sheep to remain peaceful so they can rest, they need to be removed. All these flies and the parasites must be removed that are usually associated with these animals. If they are being tormented by bugs as they're flying around their head and crawling in their ears and their nose and around their eyes, the sheep will begin to shake their heads to try to ward off all of these bugs. All y'all know exactly what I'm talking about because you live in South Florida where the state bird is the mosquito. Sheep will only be comfortable and peaceful when the shepherd puts a special ointment on their head and the face of the sheep that will keep the bugs away. Only when the sheep are free from these pests can they rest. Finally, there cannot be famine. The sheep need food. They cannot lie down to rest if they feel the need that they have to find their next meal. The job of the shepherd is to prepare pastures with nutritional grass where the sheep will have plenty to eat. The shepherd ensures that the bellies of the sheep are full so that the sheep can rest. Fear, friction, flies, famine. Let me ask this question. Does our good shepherd ensure that all of this is met for us, his sheep? Well, yes, but exactly how does the Lord do that? How does the Lord ensure that all of this criteria is met for his people? Well, beloved, he does this through the work and the efforts of his under shepherds, the pastors of his church. When a church has a real pastor and not a hireling, a pastor will ensure that the flock is protected from wolves that may come in and devour the church. And he takes care of all the pestering bugs and annoyances that is associated with all of our really wrongdoings. That gentle shepherd will quickly turn into a German shepherd when his flock is in danger. He puts out fires between the fighting sheep. He works through marriage counseling and discipleship, helping the sheep to know how to put each other's desires above their own. And most importantly, your pastors do their best to ensure that your biblical diet is filling. We work diligently as your pastors to prepare the green pastures to come Uh, for you to come and to eat until you are fat and happy. Your shepherds here at First Weston, we love you deeply, and we are ready to be spent for you and by you, all to the glory of our great shepherd. So the shepherd provides rest for his people. He provides rest for his sheep. But moving ahead... Let's ask the question again. Under the care of the good shepherd, what shall I not lack? Number two, I shall not lack restoration. First half of verse number three is where we will look. With these four words, he restores my soul. Now there are a few different possible interpretations 
for us concerning this part of the verse and what does it mean. But I think the most helpful approach for us is to go back to the experience that David was writing from. Remember, we're bringing our minds here and we're casting it back to then. We cannot forget David was a shepherd. He lived with the sheep all day, every day. He did all the hard work providing for them, something that they couldn't provide for themselves, much like what the Lord does for us. So what did David mean that the shepherd restores his soul? Let's bring our minds back to the field. Now we know that sheep grow thick wool coats on their body. I remember back home in North Florida when I was in elementary school, there was a demonstration for all of us redneck kids on how to shave a sheep. Very applicable stuff, right? The shepherd would take his clippers and go all over the sheep and to remove the wool. Maybe you've seen this process, I don't know. But the bottom line here as to what I want us to think about is the sheep that has not had their wool coat taken care of. Have you ever seen a thick wool coat on a sheep that has not been taken care of? It's full of dirt, it's full of knots, it's full of briars, it's full of sticks, it's overgrown, and so overgrown that it's almost hard to distinguish that it even is a sheep. I think this is where our minds need to be to rightly understand this verse today. When a sheep has an overgrown wool coat, it's easy for that sheep to be thrown off balance. And even more so when the sheep lies down and needs to get back up again. If the sheep has lied down and he now has rolled over because of the amount of weight of that wool that's on its body, it's going to be difficult for it to get back over upright. This is what shepherds call a sheep that has been cast down, a cast down sheep. Now that's a phrase that probably is familiar to each of you. Maybe your mind is being drawn to Psalm 42, where the author says, why are you cast down, O my soul? Why is there turmoil within me? The author of Psalm 42 has found himself much like a cast down sheep. He is unable to get himself back up off of the ground. He has been cast down And the result of being cast down is having inner turmoil. The same thing happens to sheep. When a sheep is cast down, the sheep will find itself in turmoil. It works frantically to get itself turned back over. But because of the the amount of weight of the wool coat, it'll never win. That sheep that's cast down will eventually have gases build up. It will eventually cut circulation off within the body, and soon that sheep will die. Unless, unless the shepherd comes and restores the sheep. The sheep survives because the shepherd comes to the sheep. Beloved, is that not true as to what Jesus has done for us? Wasn't it Jesus who came to seek and to save that which was lost? When the good shepherd finds his sheep, he restores their souls. He restores them again back to life. If we bring our minds back to Psalm 42, where the author says, Why are you cast down, O my soul? Why is there turmoil within me? The author uh, continues and he finishes that phrase by giving us the remedy of no longer being in turmoil. He says, Hope in God. Hope in God. Beloved, that's the remedy of being cast down. That's how the Lord restores my soul. He gives me hope. So when I am cast down, when I have this this inner turmoil, the Lord provides something that I cannot provide on my own. So therefore, because of the shepherd... I will never lack restoration. But what else? Under the care of the good shepherd, what else shall I not lack? Thirdly, I shall not lack direction. I shall not lack 
direction. Second half of verse 3, He leads me in the paths of righteousness for His name's sake. What's the immediate application of having our souls restored? Well, I am immediately given divine guidance by the shepherd as he is leading me in a path that is righteous, and he does so for his own name's sake. Everything that the Lord does, beloved, is for his name, is for his glory, it is for his reputation. As we read through this, we must ask the question, what exactly is a righteous path? The path of righteousness is most simply understood as a righteous path. Martin Luther, uh, the brother that lived 500 years ago, we sang his uh, hymn that was written again 500 years ago during the Reformation. He spoke of this phrase in Psalm 23, verse 3, as not just being a straight way, but that of a right way, a righteous way. So as I am following my shepherd, he is leading me down a path that is right, and it's not wrong. He's, living me, uh, he's leading me to live a righteous life and a holy life. He is leading me down a path that shows that he is righteous. Beloved, he leads me on paths that are righteous, the righteous path. But if you know anything like sheep, and maybe if you just know your heart pretty well, you know that sheep are the most stubborn of all animals. Sheep stray from the good path because they think that they know best. Just as the old hymn says, prone to wander, Lord, I feel it, prone to leave the God I love. Prophet Isaiah spoke of us when he said, We all, like sheep, have gone astray. Each of us has turned to his own way. So, friends, why do we do this? Well, why do we leave the path that the Lord has led me down? If we'll be honest with each other this morning, it's because the other paths look better. Sometimes the other paths look easier to walk on. Sometimes the other paths look like that they will bring us more happiness. But all these other paths lead to sin. And beloved, as the old saying goes, sin always overpromises and sin always under delivers. As I was studying for this, I was reminded of John Bunyan's classic book called The Pilgrim's Progress. I'm sure that most of you are familiar with it. Christian, who was the main character of the book, was traveling to the celestial city and was with his friend named Hopeful. They had a map that led them down the King's Highway, which is an allusion to our verse here today, A Path of Righteousness. The King's Highway would eventually bring Christian and Hopeful to walking on a path that was rocky, and it was rough, and it was described as making their feet sore. Now, while the path that they were currently on did not look like it was the right path, it was the right path because it was the King's path. It was the King's Highway. It was the righteous way. And the story goes on that as they're traveling on it, that, that Christian would see this meadow, and this meadow was nice. It looked like it had a good path on it that would have provided a lot more stability for their feet that wouldn't have caused their feet to be sore. It looked like a much better path. They thought that that path would still bring them to the celestial city. But the only thing is that It didn't. It didn't bring them to the celestial city. In fact, the path that that they were on now is where they would find themselves to be captured by the giant despair who would bring them to the doubting castle where they would live in a cage for several days with their thoughts of their sin against the king. It's where they found themselves downcast, which is really the logical conclusion of living in sin. Friends, I actually think that this describes you and I pretty accurately. 
How many times have we left the path that the Lord has set us on just because we thought that we knew better? How many times have we questioned if this path is the right path? How many times have we forsook the holy and the righteous way that God instructs us to live and the righteous path that he commands us to walk on? How many times do we find ourselves wandering and leaving the God that we love? We do it every day when we think that we know best. But beloved, there is a better way. There is a righteous way. My mind is drawn to the text that I'm sure most of you have committed to memory. Proverbs 3, verses 5 and 6. Trust in the Lord with all of your heart and lean not on your own understanding. In all of your ways acknowledge him and he shall direct your what? Paths. We must follow the Lord and refuse to be led by our own desires. Why? Because if we lean on our own understanding for direction, when we are trusting in our own hearts and our own devices for guidance, then we will be led astray just like Christian and hopeful. When we follow our hearts, it leads us to a path that will lead to despair and doubt, and we will eventually be cast down. When I follow the Lord... When I trust in him, when I acknowledge my shepherd, he will direct my paths. He will place me on paths of righteousness and he will give me direction. Friends, his direction is always right, even when it doesn't look like his paths are right. So the Lord provides us rest. The Lord provides us restoration and he provides us direction. Let's ask the question again. Under the care of the good shepherd, what else shall I not lack? Number four, I shall not lack security. Verse four says this, Yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil, for you are with me. Your rod and your staff, they comfort me. Now, there's a lot to say here with this very well-known verse, but there's something that immediately jumps off the page when I read this verse. I want you to notice the intimacy with me here that David provides. Look at the pronouns. There's a shift in them. In verses 1 through 3, we see that David is referring to his shepherd as he. He's the one who makes me lie down. He leads me beside still waters. He's the one who's guiding me. But now it seems as if it's become more personal with David as he realizes that he has nothing to fear because you are with me. Your rod, your staff, they are the things that are comforting me. He's no longer talking about his shepherd. He's now talking to his shepherd. The keen awareness that we possess of the presence of God in our lives when we walk through difficulty is really hard to put into words. So this brings us to the question, a logical one, what exactly is this valley of shadow of death and how in the world can I be comforted by it or comforted while I am in it? You guys know what a valley is. A valley is this long and low area that's typically associated and found in between two different hills or two different mountains. They're typically associated with streams and rivers that are running through them and it's providing lush, uh, nutritional pastures. But it's also associated with danger. Because the valleys are found in low areas, these taller mountains would consistently cast large and looming shadows all over the valleys. Now, hiding throughout the valley, hiding throughout all of the shadows, was different predators waiting for their next meal. This is why the valley was always associated with death. But the valleys were necessary for the sake of the sheep because it was in the valleys that the sheep had to spend their winters. But no doubt, the valleys are scary and unpredictable, but understand this, beloved. It's where the shepherd leads. Needless to say that throughout our lifetimes that we have found ourselves in the valley at some point in time. 
Sometimes we just look at our circumstances and we begin to question God. We begin to question our shepherd, asking why. Why here? Why now? Why is this happening to me? We question the shepherd because we don't know where we are going and we don't know where we are heading. Why are we going to this valley? Why are we in that valley? Why can't we go to this mountaintop? Why not that mountaintop over there? Sometimes we look at our situations and we just don't have any understanding as to why we are being led there. But the Lord knows where he's going. Friends, I can tell you with confidence that not a single step of your journey with the Lord is wasted. The Lord knows where he's going, so therefore we can trust our good shepherd. Why can we trust him? Because his paths are righteous and they're never wrong. Not only that, but we need to be reminded that the valley of the shadow of death is as much of the righteous path as it is the green pastures. The valley is just as righteous as the still waters. While the Lord brings us to rest through the green pastures and the still waters, the Lord also gives us the valleys. The paths are not always mountaintop experiences. And when we find ourselves in the valleys, and certainly we will find ourselves in the valleys, we must develop Christian character. It must develop a complete trust in the Lord and knowing that if the Lord has led me here, then he will eventually and most certainly lead me out of that valley. And beloved, remember this. When we are in the valley, we are never, ever alone. While I may sense danger, the danger is being warded off because of my shepherd's rod and his staff. He's beating off all of the wolves and the predators that want to, to take my life, that, that want to consume me. My shepherd is protecting me. My shepherd is keeping me safe. Therefore, I will fear no evil. Why? Because the Lord is with me. And this is a promise, though we find it here in Psalm 23, we find it consistently throughout the scriptures. It's a promise that God offered Jacob in Genesis 28 when he said, Behold, I am with you and will keep you wherever you go. It's a word of assurance that has been proclaimed to young Jeremiah when he said, Do not be afraid of their faces, for I am with you to deliver you, says the Lord. It's a promise that we find in Isaiah chapter 41. Fear not, for I am with you. It's found within the heart of the preaching of Haggai when he said, I am with you, says the Lord. It's the promise that lit the early church on fire as the great commission had been given to the people found in Matthew 28. And Jesus came and spoke to them saying, all authority has been given to me in heaven and on earth. Go therefore and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all things that I've commanded you. And lo, I am with you always, even to the end of the age. And friends, it is a promise that we cling to today found in Hebrews 13, 5. For he himself has said, I will never leave you nor forsake you. Beloved, if the promise here is true, if it's true, then we will never lack safety. It may look like that we are in danger and we may even feel the sting of the world, but we are always under the care of our shepherd. And friends, there is no valley that's too deep. There is no valley that is too dark, which will prevent King Jesus from using his rod and his staff to provide us safety. Amen? Moving forward, our question again. Under the care of the good shepherd, what else shall I not lack? Number five, I shall not lack provision. 
I shall not lack provision. Verse 5. You prepare a table before me in the presence of my enemies. You anoint my head with oil. My cup runs over. Now we need to remember something very important here. The shepherd protects the sheep at all costs. He protects them from the predators, but that doesn't mean that all the predators have left. It doesn't mean that all the wolves are gone. The wolves still lurk. The wolves still watched from a distance. They're still there. But the sheep are fully protected by the shepherd who has not left them. And it's at this point where we find where the Lord prepares a table in front of all of those enemies. The picture that David is trying to help us to see is literally imagining a shepherd that is working a field. He's working a field by pulling the the weeds. He's pulling the, the poisonous plants. He's getting rid of all of the pebbles and the rocks so the sheep do not eat them. He's removing all of the hazardous things that would prevent the sheep from moving or might even hurt the sheep. He's preparing a table for them to eat from, and he's doing it with the predators watching. This table is set for those who the Lord calls his friends, an honor that's not just for anybody. Then David says that the Lord anoints his head with oil. Now, this is not a custom that we practice here in America. I've never been to any of your homes where you meet me at the door with some oil and pour it all over my head. That would be weird, so let's not do that. But in this context, this was acceptable. This actually was expected. Why was it expected? Well, remember, we're bringing our minds when it was to when it was written. Historical Palestine was very hot. It was very dry. So this oil was a kind of gesture for guests to put onto their dried and cracked skin. Not only that, but hospitality also demanded that wine would be poured into the cups of their guests to clear the dry throat. Historical context tells us that it could have been and most likely would have been a literal cup and not just a metaphorical cup to which this ter- uh, this verse has typically been applied. But whether it's literal or metaphorical, the bottom line here is that provision has been made by the shepherd. The shepherd has provided for the needs of his people. The picture that's being painted here is what should be imagined as we come into the presence of the Lord. He brings us to his table, or as the book of Revelation calls it, the marriage supper of the Lamb. The table is set. We've been anointed with the purest of all, and our cups overflow with joy. Beloved, there is a rich supply in the Lord's storehouse that will never come to an end. And as... We understand in the book of Jude, the Lord presents us to himself with exceeding joy as we come into his presence. So you see, friends, that when we come into the presence of the Lord, it will be joyful for us. But it's not just one-sided. The Lord will also have exceeding joy to have us as his guests. So we're seeing that under the care of the good shepherd, I will not lack rest, I will not lack restoration or direction i will not lack security and i will not lack provision we got one more under the care of the good shepherd what shall i not lack number six i shall not lack a heavenly home i shall not lack a heavenly home verse six Surely goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life, and I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. Now David wrote a lot of psalms, potentially 75 or even more. We find in several of the psalms where he is being pursued by his enemies. Psalm 3 actually describes 
uh, where David says there's ten thousands of enemies and they're surrounding me all around. His enemies consistently were pursuing him. Is that what we find here in verse number six? Are his enemies pursuing him now in verse number six? No. What's pursuing him? It's actually the shepherd. The shepherd himself is pursuing him with his goodness and with his mercy. And not just once, not just maybe twice, but all the days of his life, he is being pursued by the mercy and the goodness of our great shepherd. And friends, that's true of you too if you found yourself in the Lord Jesus Christ. The scriptures teach that if you have trusted Jesus and his perfect life of obedience and his work on the cross, if you have trusted the gospel of Jesus Christ by faith, you too will always have the Lord's goodness and mercy pursue you until you take your last breath or the Lord returns. This is the expectation that we can have while we are here on earth as his people. This is what the very first half of verse number six teaches us. But what about the second half? The second half of verse number six actually points our attention to the future and the rich enjoyment that we will have in the house of the Lord. The word forever indicates that this is an eternal destination. So what does David have in mind here when he's writing this verse? What exactly is the house of the Lord? What is David desiring to go to after being led to the green pastures and to the still waters? What is found at the end of the tunnel after walking the path of righteousness? What is to be longed for when we are in the valley? What is the culmination of life here on earth? Where are we finally going to have true rest? What is the house of the Lord. Friends, it's heaven. That's what the house of the Lord is. For God's sheep, heaven is where we will truly rest forever. Home is heaven. That's what we long after. Now, none of us are strangers to traveling. We've all been to hotels or Airbnbs where the accommodations are being made for us to try to make us feel like home. But as our good friend Dorothy says, there's no place like home. So even in that Airbnb that's nice, it's not home. Likewise for the Christian, this world is not our home. We may have some comforts, we may have some joys, but this is not our true home. We will always feel like aliens as we are looking forward to heaven And as the old Southern Gospel hymn says, that's called Sweet Beulah Land, I'm kind of homesick for a country to which I've never been before. Beulah Land, I'm longing for you. Some sweet day on thee I'll stand. There my home shall be eternal. Beulah Land, sweet Beulah Land. So to feel like strangers here is is normal. Because heaven is our home, not earth. Jesus helps us to understand this as well in John 14, 3, where he says, if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again and take you to myself where I am. You may also be. Well, but there's a lot of things when we think about heaven that will bring us enjoyment. There will be streets of gold that we can enjoy. There's, there's gates that are made of single pearls that we will be able to enjoy. We will enjoy the fact that there will be no debt. There will be no sorrow. There will be no more crying. There will be tons of things for us to have joy. But that's not where the purest form of joy is going to flow from. The joy of heaven will be Jesus. That's the purest form of joy. The joy of heaven will be Jesus, our great shepherd, our true treasure. And the joy will never end, which is far beyond what our imagination can truly handle. 
So Psalm 23 is a comforting text, a text that we are all familiar with, that we've heard taught within funerals or even pop culture references. But for the Christian, there's not many other texts that we find that bring us comfort and hope. This morning, Psalm 23 has taught us that we will never lack. We have learned that we will never lack rest or restoration. We have learned that we will never lack direction or safety. Uh, David teaches, his, teaches us here that we will never lack provision or a heavenly home. As we are being led by the shepherd, and we are being provided all of these things here, let me ask this question. Have you ever seen Jesus before? And I'm not talking about, you know, a painting or a picture. Have you ever seen the shepherd? Well, the answer, the answer is no. And this is what the world finds so strange. You're following after something that you don't see. But understand, beloved, one day that will change. Revelation chapter 22, verses 3 and 4 say this. And there shall be no more curse, but the throne of God and of the Lamb shall be in it, and his servants shall serve him. They shall see his face. They shall see his face. This is the promise that our minds need to focus on as we leave here today. This is the application of our time together, that by faith on that glorious day, we will see our shepherd. We should be looking forward and waiting in anticipation that one day we will join the the shepherd and we will see him. And it's beyond our imagination. Beloved, we will see his face and we will see it with clarity. This is the joy that we look forward to. Because as the shepherd is making the sheep to lie down in green pastures, he's bringing us along the still waters. He's leading us through the valleys and he's protecting us. He's bringing us to the tables and provides for us. We have this promise that one day we will see his face and we will dwell together in the house of the Lord forever. So beloved, cast your minds to the future. Maybe you're unsure of the path that you're on. Think of the future. Look to the future when you're in the valley. Because if you are on the king's righteous path, then the, that is the right path. And that path will bring you to the celestial city where you will dwell with the, in the house of the Lord forever. Amen? Let's pray. Lord, we are excited for that day where we will see you face to face. We anticipate the day, Lord, that we anticipate the day, Lord, that we will come to your house and be with you forever. But Lord, we're not there yet. We're still on this path. So as we look forward of being able to see you face to face with the utmost of clarity, help us to continue to labor on here for your glory, for your name, for your reputation. Father, may we be comforted by the words of Psalm 23, that you are our good shepherd and that you will eventually lead us to yourself. We ask these things through your son's name. Amen.